So what's new in visualizing survey data? So here's the agenda that I have planned for the hour. I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm hoping nobody's disappointed. It's not like this earth shattering. I developed a whole new way to visualize Likert scale data. It's more, I used to think people should present it this way, but I think this is a better way to do it. And I'll give you my argument for it. I've got some stuff that's in the works that's going to be coming out in Q3 and Q4. I could use your help on some stuff and you'll see what that's about. And I want to leave a good 10, 12 minutes at least for Q&A at the end. And I do want to thank uh, my friends and colleagues, Susan, Shailen, and Josh, who are going to monitor the Q&A and the chat window and act as proxies for the audience. So let me give you the overarching take on this. Two, three years ago in the survey data classes that I used to give on a pretty regular basis, I would say, hey, I think this is a pretty cool way to show check all that apply questions broken down by the different demographics that you have. And, you know, I've got a blog post that tells you how to build this thing. And it's absolutely valid, but I'm going to make an argument for why I think this is a better way to show it. And there's a whole bunch of interactivity in it as well. Same with some Likert scale stuff. For, for years, I thought, oh, here's Likert scale nirvana this divergent stack bar chart, and in particular, this notion of the neutrals, I'm going to make half of them positive, half of them negative. And I think that's a mistake. For years, I advocated for this, and I still have colleagues who think this is fine, but I would now go with something like this. Granted, it's just three levels of stuff there. We can show it with five levels of stuff, but I think it's important that the neutrals have their own baseline. And again, I'll give you my argument for this. You can either agree or tell me, gosh, Wexler, you're just nuts. There's a sample data set that I've been using for a while, and it's still valid. And maybe the most important thing that's still valid is the approach to setting up your data a certain way. I don't think that's changed, even with the relationship model in, in Tableau and the noodle. There's some use cases for it, and I'm going to build some stuff around it, but I think hey, you get your data set up right the way I've been advocating it for a while, I think you're in great shape. So that hasn't changed. So a question like this that's on a survey, will you vote in the upcoming election? A single punch question. Here's the way that the data might be encoded. Your survey tool, most of them will allow you to download the data as either numeric responses or the text responses. And then here's how you might visualize something like this. The check all that apply or multi-punch questions. Please indicate all the things you measure. How it may get encoded in your survey data pool as text, as numbers. And then I'm going to make a case for, here's why I think you should visualize it like this. Likert scale questions and sentiment questions indicate the degree to which you agree or disagree. Here it is as text. Here it is as numbers. And I'm going to show you six different ways to do this. And I'm going to ask people to vote on which way they prefer. If you're wondering, hey, I'm using Qualtrics. I'm using SurveyMonkey. I'm using SurveyGizmo. I'm using whatever tool. Why can't I just download the data and just go? Yeah. Well, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. The way you get the data when you download it and the way you want it to be that hasn't changed. And we still need to, this one row per respondent thing. And there are some questions that enjoy this august reverential status because you're going to be filtering or cutting the questions by this. By the way, there are ways in Tableau to decide what on the fly. This question I want to promote to something that I can be uh, cut by. In any case, we need to reshape the data so that um, there's a separate row for all the questions every respondent answered. And in fact, you want to have all this additional metadata about this. Hey, what's the question they, what was the question ID? This question ID, Q2 underscore two, what type of question is it? And uh, what was the grouping that it's with? And what was the actual wording that the user saw? So all of this is getting your data just so. That's still up on my website, hasn't changed at all. So who's influencing me besides my three colleagues here and other people who will send me emails or tweet stuff? I'm very heavily influenced by the work that Pew Research. If they want to show percentage of people 
that fall into categories and broken down by different demographics, they will create this type of chart. There are four different terms for it. It's called a barbell chart, a dumbbell chart, a connected dot plot. And then the term I first heard, I'm sure the term has been used for years, but I first heard my friend and colleague, Randy Crum, who wrote the cool book, Cool Infographics. He calls it a gap chart because it's really good at showing where the gaps are between different demographics. Here's another example from Pew Research. Yet another example, I, what they did here is they're showing the total in between. They're not showing the totals here. This group versus this group and the overall. This is surprisingly messy from The Economist. And it may have gotten, when I copied and pasted it from the website, the grid lines may have been over-accented, bringing up baby indicators of national child care policies. And I know that is something that's probably on the mind of one of the attendees who's here today. And so the vertical line that's here is the, that's the overall ranking. I like that. Oh, what's the overall versus the ranking for leave access quality? Can't help noticing that the United States is ranked second to last when it comes to maternity and paternity leave. So that's the, this dot plot gap chart. But what about sentiment data? I'm leaning towards this or I'm leaning towards that. Um, and here's Pew Research again, and they really like the divergent stack bar chart. Here's another showing how things are diverging. Here, they're showing diverging. I just want to show you, they're doing what would be logical. Very bad, somewhat bad, somewhat good, very good, worst to best. And same thing over here, decreased a lot, decreased a little. And I would argue that putting the more concentrated values in the center, while not intuitive, makes a whole lot of sense. I'm going to show you a case where an organization did that. And then I'm going to make my case for why I think you should do it as well. Oh, here's the organization that did it. This is a partnership with Axios did with Momentive. Who's Momentive? That's the new name for the company that makes SurveyMonkey. And you'll notice here that the more concentrated values, so it's uh, not so likely is on the left and not likely at all, and very likely is hugging the baseline. And then the somewhat likely is on the outside. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Other stuff with the divergent stack bar chart. What do you do with the neutrals? I think things are going to decrease, increase, and stay about the same. And you'll see Pew Research is not making half negative, half positive, but they're putting them in their own column. Same with this example that's over here. So in any case, this has had an influence on me. Let me explain my argument for the, the, the whole issue of the more concentrated values being along the baseline, I, ne I need to express the laws of stack bar charts and the problems with them. So I show this in my workshops and I make an important point of making sure people understand this in the new book, Big Picture. In any case, what have I got here? I want to compare my stuff with all other stuff now, overall, I can see that the sales for South is greater than West, is greater than Central, or greater than East. But suppose I want to focus just on my stuff, things that I'm responsible for selling. This is really hard to say which of those bars is the longest because they're floating. You don't have the common baseline. If I move them to the inside, let's just focus on that for a minute. This becomes a really easy read even without sorting it by my stuff, I can see central is bigger than south, is bigger than west, is bigger than east. So the law, of, the rule of a stacked bar chart is it's great to show overall and then whatever is hugging the baseline. So with that in mind, let me get out of this and let's start looking at some of the stuff. So I'm gonna start with a single punch question and show you how I used to walk people through how to create it, and then show you why I think there's a better way with this. So my data is set up just show, so I can you know put question type on filters and go, oh, I wanna look at all the single punch questions I've got at the same time. I'll go to my question grouping and realize, oh, I've only got one question. It's that, do you plan to vote in the upcoming election? And I'll put my labels up on rows, don't know, yes, no. And hey, I'm old school. I'm going to put number, I have a calculated field. 
called number of records. That does not come automatically anymore in Tableau because of the whole relationship model. So number of records, I just want you to see it's the same of using, hey, you've got this field that's at the bottom of things. It's gonna give you exactly the same results. In any case, I find this pretty useful. Let me sort this in descending order, make the chart a little narrower. Let me do the um, percentage of total. And let me turn numbers on. And this two decimal places, it absolutely offends me. One is it clutters the chart. And two, it suggests a level of accuracy that you just doesn't exist in survey data, unless you in fact surveyed every single person, in which case, yeah, you're as accurate as possible, but your surveys are probably going to have plus or minus two, three percent in them. Let me just change the format of this because it's driving me crazy here, percentage zero decimal places. Okay, I feel better now. All right, so let's say I want to see, you know, what the breakdown is by gender. And I'm going to get some stupid results here because we've got a table calculation here and it's doing percent of total and it doesn't realize how I want to get the percent of total. Interestingly, if I put gender up there, yeah, that's right. But I want to see how much more is men than women, et cetera. So this is for people new to Tableau. This can be a little confusing. I'll edit the table calculation and I need to go to specific dimensions. And what I'm essentially saying here is for just the women, get the percentage of total for the yeses, the noes, and the don't knows. And when you're done with the women, start over again with the men or whatever the breakdown is. So that's now working. One of the things I teach pretty early on is that, you know what, I'm gonna have a parameter here and I'd love to change this by break it down by nothing, break it down by gender, break it down by generation. So I'm over here in case you didn't see that. And so I'm gonna put this over here. That's a hot mess. There's some really interesting stuff in here, but it's a clustered bar chart. And even if Tableau did clustered bar charts, this is pretty hard to read at this point. Also, I just wanna plant a, a little seed for something. I'm gonna break down by none. And hey, I'd like to put a filter here. So let me show this filter. Let me show this filter. This is my problem with filters. Hey, I just want to see the traditionalists and the baby boomers. Wow, that worked great. But oh, what did the chart look like before you applied the filter? So if you only care about baby boomers and traditionalists, filters are great. If you want to know how does that differ from what I had before, all right, we'll get into that. In any case, let me do the breakdown here by gender. Let me duplicate this sheet. And let me show you how I would, oops. Duplicate, not duplicate is cross tab. Here's how I would do this now. I put breakdown on color. I change this to a circle chart. I'm not going to show the numbers. Duplicate this field. I'm holding down the control key. I don't know what it is on a Mac, but there's the functional equivalent of that. Let me change this chart to being a line chart. And, and by the way, look, I don't expect anyone to follow this recipe this quickly. I've got blog posts on how to do this. And if you want to create a gap chart, there are tons of blog posts that will tell you how to do this. Let me put breakdown over here. Let me make this a, uh, so I'm putting it on path. So it's saying, oh, you want to connect the line between uh, men and women or whatever we change the breakdown to. Let me make this a dual axis chart. So now one chart is on top of the other. Synchronize this, move this one to the back. And oh, let me do a few things here to make it look oh so cool. So I'm going to change the size of this to be a little smaller. Let me make the size of the line quite a bit thicker. That's pretty good. Let me make the color of this quite a bit paler. That looks pretty good. Let me make the header here. And I'll show you one more thing 
that I think makes this look oh so cool. This technique comes from Chris Love of the Information Lab. I'm going to put this max zero thing here. That's going to create a zero line that's over here. Let me make this smaller. Let me not show the header. Yes, anything that surrounds a chart is called a header, including these things that are along the left side. Don't ask me. Let me just do a little more formatting here. Let me go to the circles, just the circles. Let me make the size a little bit larger. Yeah, let me get rid of the, sorry, the formatting on this. I don't need the row divider. I don't need the column divider. And that actually looks pretty good. So here's the breakdown by none. Here's the breakdown by gender. Here's the breakdown by generation. And we can make it so that, oh, let's do this. I'll turn mark labels on, but just highlight it. See, is that working properly? There we go. So I can see 40% or I can see the difference between baby boomers and traditionalists or you get the idea. Cation, see what's the difference between Antarctica and Europe. But I'm missing the overall. So let me show you what I think the, the completed version. So here's the breakdown by none. Here's the breakdown by gender and the vertical line, as well as what's in the header is the overall. I'll break this down by generation. And what I've got here is showing me the demographic breakdown that I you might argue, oh, maybe make the circles larger or smaller. That could be pretty problematic. You would think, hey, let me make the circle larger to indicate I've got so many more respondents. But I was sparring with pretty badass when it comes to um, the statistics and data visualization history, the word Wainer. And he was saying, oh, the large dot means there's uncertainty. Is it, it could be as small as this, it could be as large as this. So I'm thinking, make the dot large to indicate you got a lot of responses. And he's saying, make the dot larger to indicate it's not precisely 21.32%. I'm just punting on this all together. I'm saying, look, you got this many baby boomers, this many generation X, and the dot here means, hey, you've got under whatever the magic number is in your case, 30 respondents indicate you know, the number of respondents here is really low, probably shouldn't take this too seriously. The, I'm not going to get into the particulars of how to create this reference line. It requires a somewhat complicated level of detail calculation. I have shared that in blog posts and I promise to share it when this workbook becomes available. Remember we talked about the whole filter thing and in a moment I'm going to pause for a moment, take some questions, and I'd love to hear what my colleagues think about this. But Tableau, I don't know which release, a while back introduced this concept of, um, of set controls. Now these things look like filters, but instead they're saying determines what elements are in the set and what are not in the set. So let's say I'm really interested in seeing what male baby boomers and generation X think compared to everyone who's not a male generation X or baby boomer. So I'm gonna select males. Okay, and I can see there's 170 of them versus, so th this is no different than the breakdown by gender that we had before. But also I just want to look at baby boomers and generation X. So the 131, those are the, the teal colored. So the male baby boomers and generation X selected this and everybody else that isn't in that category. And, and we can keep adding this as well. So now I've got just European, Asian, Antarctican, and I didn't bother to specify where I'm from. Those 62 people responded this way and everybody else responded this way, but the overall response was this. That's where I am with, I'm gonna you know, stop sharing for a minute 
And I have not seen anything that's coming in on chat at the moment or the questions that are coming in here. So my esteemed colleagues, is there uh, anything that's really bubbling up to the top that, that strikes you as, hey, I think people are a little confused about this, that, or One of the things that a number of people are asking is if there is going to be a recording available of this. Uh, I am recording it as session. we speak, and it will be available probably within a week. So yes, there's a okay. recording. Uh, one of our respondents just wanted me to tell you that they think you're oh so cool. The awe. And then, okay, here's a question from Thomas Nguyen. I have a question about data structure. For example, in the beginning, respondents will have several multiple select questions, like products they use or channels they use, and there will be a single select. In the end, they want to build a dashboard where... I can slice the data with different combinations. Respondents who use product one and channels two and four, for example. One way is to multiplicate everything and have a row for each respondent, but that gets troublesome with big data sets. Do you have ideas about using relationships or other approaches to managing that kind of a sort of a combo selection on a dashboard between single select and choose all? Okay, so give me one minute here to just... Uh... Uh, bring something up. So I'm working, the cutting by check all that apply questions is a huge pain in the ass. I've got some stuff. I did a video on this and I suspect the magical mythical noodle, the relationship model, there may be some good stuff there, but I do want to show you, let me see if I can find it, visualize and survey data and how on the fly, you can decide what this thing was pivoted this particular question, but I want to be able to filter or cut by that question. It's not gender, generation, education, income level. It's just something else. So let me show you where this lives. Enter question analysis. It's right here. Cut and filter any question by any other question. And essentially the magic calculation is here. And it works great. If you want to have a flexible, your, you need oh, I'm to not share sharing, your, am I? Yeah, thank you. Ah, where I went was resources, visualizing survey data. And had I just typed into a question, we could have found it pretty easily. But the magic of this thing, and by the way, I don't remember this stuff. I wrote this three years ago. I had to use this recently. I just copied and pasted this, but this is saying, I'm deciding that this question Q0 is now going to be like a, a demographic question. And you can do that with as many as you want with them. If you want to do something on, um, have this extensible as a menu that says, I want to do it by this or by that or by this, that's part two of this. And that should, that should handle that for you. So this is a check all that apply question. Here's overall, what do people measure? adrenaline production, metabolism, blood pressure, breathing, et cetera. And I'd like to see it broken down by the same things. I want to see it broken down by blood pressure. Oh, no, excuse me. I just want to focus on blood pressure and see the difference amongst baby boomers, Generation X, millennials, and traditionalists. Say, wow, there's a huge difference right here between among traditionalists and everybody else. Now, overall, it's 61%. But you can see this here. This is pretty cool. The problem with it is you have to go fishing for the interesting stuff. Ooh, pulse rate. Look at that. Metabolism. I'm kind of into this as the way that I would do it. I have the same thing as we had before, breakdown by none. And then we want to see where these things are. And you can start to see, oh, there's a pretty big gap here without having to select it and then find it. You'll notice that I'm avoiding putting numbers on everything. I've become a declutter freak that having a, a separate number on all these things, but some interesting gaps here. And you can certainly select this group and then select you know, the millennials and to see, wow, big difference between the oldest group and the youngest group. Is this something worth uh, exploring? Although there are so few traditionalists who answered this, I'd say, I don't know if you should even show the data with this particular question. And this is not terribly difficult. The how do you get the overall is a little easier than in the single punch question. But just a reminder, the check all that apply. Is this the one I want? 
is if your data is coded just right, anyone who responded to the question, the answers were either zeros or ones. I can tell you, you can get your data just perfectly from Qualtrics, that there are certain options and settings, and it will absolutely give your data perfectly. SurveyMonkey, you have to do a little more work on some stuff, but if they check something, it's a one. If they didn't check it, it's a zero. If they didn't answer the question, it's a null. You know, add up all the ones divided by the number of people that are there, et cetera. Super easy to say, hey, I want to just break this down by, so you put, make this a, a circle chart, a separate circle for, in this case, baby boomers, generation X, millennials, and traditionalists. You do the same thing again, and then the check all that apply overall, don't worry about the selected versus others, but it says, hey, the breakdown, this versus this group, pretend it's not there, okay? It's not there. I know it's there, but just pretend it's not there. So just give me, pretend it's like this. And that's how you get that. Little trickier with a single punch question. And let me show you the same thing using set controls. How about something like this, which is, hey, I just wanna know what male, baby boomer, generation X who are in Europe, Asia, Antarctica, and not specified. What did they select versus everybody else? So I would say this breakdown by and set controls is probably a, a, a pretty cool way to go with this stuff. I want to get into the Likert scale stuff, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. And so here is this divergent, but the neutrals are in the center. And I built something. I've got a whole bunch of different Likert scale questions. Now, I want you to notice some stuff that's going on. The labels here are changing from uh, disagree, agree, and neutral, not satisfied and neutral. I'm sorting by the most positive to the least positive. I can sort by the most negative to the least negative. And if you hover over these things, you can see the full response to it. So if somebody says, yeah, but you're only showing two levels, this is very satisfied and satisfied, a pretty big difference here. These people are wildly satisfied and here there's only some that are satisfied. So I'm leaning towards just three levels, but if I were doing four levels, I'd probably do it like this. And that's so, I don't have the highlighting thing going on. Let me go into this. The, I probably will never look at just the satisfied by themselves. I'm really interested in the very satisfied and comparing that, or I'd be interested in doing both. So the, the ability to easily to compare. So look at this one. Wow, that's a really pretty high concentration of dissatisfaction here or not at all satisfied. And having that along the baseline, even though you're saying somewhat dissatisfied, very dissatisfied, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied. The, the rule of stack bar charts is, I think this works better, but you just got to hip your audience to this. So this is the divergent approach where, where the concentrated values are in the center. Or you do something like this and not go divergent and just have not satisfied, neutral, satisfied. Or you can decide to do the negatives. I, I don't want to tip my hand on some stuff, but you'll notice that the labels here are all changing as I change the type of thing. So it's really great. You built one visualization and it works for all your Likert stuff. Hopefully you have a consistent Likert scale, five point quite, it drives me crazy when somebody decides, and we decided to put in a six point or a seven point Likert just to make your life miserable. Of course they didn't do it just to make my life miserable. It just feels that way. Here's the same thing again, where the more concentrated values are on the inside. Let's go to importance or let's go to satisfaction. And I feel pretty strongly that having the more concentrated along the baseline is important. And I also feel strongly that the neutrals by themselves is important. 
So you can see where are the really big neutrals? There, there's an interesting story that can be there. And you just don't see that if you're if there's strat half positive, half negative. I'll show you one more item here. Hold on, make satisfaction. Let me do this sorted by positives. And I want to show you, gee, I want to break this down by generation. Which one? Hold on, ease of use. Looking for something here. Nope, maybe it's on importance. No, I've got it. I'm looking for something. Yeah. Take a look at this one for a minute. So this is the, the, how do I see the breakdown? I can see overall the sentiment here, but now I want to see the breakdown by generation. So this has that same issue we had before when I was showing rank and magnitude, you got to click and see if there's anything interesting. How would you do something like this for liquor data? And just remember this one here, 34% of generation X are, uh, uh, but a whopping 49% are not satisfied. And I would say, you know what, this is why we often see percent top two boxes. And this is a great way to show this percent top two boxes. And I'm looking at support for mobile devices and, oh, well, wait a second. I'm only seeing the top two boxes and I'm missing that there's a F ton of traditionalists, and by the way, there are way more than who answered this question. This must have been earlier on in the survey and they didn't get fatigued from doing the survey. Same with everybody, way more respondents to this. I would argue we need to also look at bottom two boxes on this thing, but I, I would say if you wanna show the breakdown, it's really hard to do on Likert stuff. Nothing will stop me from doing this. Hold on, you go to the sheet and you know, I can put, There it is, there it is, your breakdown all in one place. That's just overwhelming. So I, I the approach with the, the gap chart for top two boxes, but I think you're gonna have to also offer bottom two boxes. So that's everything that I've been working on. When I do the survey data class, I would show people how to do these things as opposed to some of the other ways of having them build it. So that's the exploration. Let me tell you what's in the works. I'm gonna to try to put together the mother of all survey data workbooks or the big ass workbook um, that has every single example, every single way, and as well as annotations for how these things were built and then where the blog posts are that explain them. And I'm hoping to do that in Q3. The survey data white paper, I think the last revision of it was from 1957. It's time that needs to be updated. It's actually from 2016. So that's in the works. More experimentation. I have gotten a bunch of open text responses from people. There's some new technology that I'm looking into with my friend and colleague Greg Lewandowski. I'm going to, I have an ask for net promoter score data and some stuff in the works on check all the uh, apply questions. And I'm almost certain I'm going to do this, the survey data class that I'm offering again in person in uh, July. I'm hoping to make this something to take on demand in Q4. All right, here's where I can use your help. I need some longitudinal net promoter score data. This net promoter score is, is a special case of sentiment data, but the scale, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, goes from zero to 10. I've got a whole blog post on this. In any case, I don't have great longitudinal data, meaning stuff that's changing weekly, monthly, quarterly, because I've got some ideas on how to show it. But the particular data set I have is this isn't lending itself to it. So this is a work in progress here. But if you've got some net promoter score data, I promise I won't share it with anybody without your permission and we'll totally anonymize it. And look at it as you're getting some free consulting from me. I'll build out something on, on your data for you. The other is I'd like you to weigh in on which of these I almost said, which do you think your stakeholders would prefer versus which do you prefer? But if you could take one moment right now to go to bigpick.me front slash Likert, and it is pronounced Likert, not Likert, um, indicate deal showing sentiment. Do you like a, a or do you like B? You know, which, which do you think um, leads to 
a greater degree of understanding faster. There you go. A or B. So go to bigpick.me front slash Likert. By the way, the, the person who came up with the Likert scale, his name was Rensis Likert. He was the founder of the Human Resource Institute, later renamed the Institute for Corporate Productivity, where I had a job there for two and a half years doing survey data. And his PhD thesis was creating the Likert scale, this idea of a quantitative measure for qualitative notions. And I know everyone wants to pronounce it Likert, but if you were to ask him, and he died long before I joined I4CP, he would say it's Likert. All right. Oh, so I'm curious. Let me see how we got the results. I'm refreshing them now, and I'm going to make this a much bigger poll. What I didn't want to do is tell you this thing on the left, major pain in the ass to build this thing in Tableau. The, by a major pain in the ass, probably if this took one hour to build, this is going to take two and a half. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Hold on. I'm actually going to demonstrate some of the stuff just so you know what you're in for with this. So let me go to this sheet. And you're going to notice a bunch of things happen that, you know, this stays exactly the same place. Center line all stays right. This thing, it's because there are a bunch of reference lines in here. Hold on. Okay, and now try importance. Wait a minute, this thing doesn't line up nicely and support by satisfaction. Well, that one looks good by like this. And also look at the size of this bar, 39%. It's way bigger than that bar. You know, I didn't want to say, oh, by the way, this thing that you want to build that you like so much more, to really do it, it's going to be harder. But I've got full instructions on how to do it. And I think it indicated you prefer it. And clearly Pew Research prefers it. So I'm going to send this poll out to a whole bunch of other people. I've got one more ask from you, and then I'm just going to open this up to Q&A, which is if you can help me spread the word. So. I've done a lot of stuff in data visualization, and I think the thing I'm most proud of is this new book, which is really not geared towards the practitioner. I'm trying to get people who are not yet comfortable with reading charts and graphs to be really excited by how transformative they can be. So my request is, please share this, get people to be excited about just how empowering data visualization can be. And if you've not done so, uh, please leave a rating and or write a review. I, hopefully you write a good one, but just weigh in and, and go to Amazon and uh, leave a review. Let me stop sharing. And we've got 10 minutes or so, and I'm happy to open this thing up to questions and comments. And hey, so I'll, I'm going to start first with just asking Josh and Shaylin and Susan, uh, Things make sense. Anything unclear? Does the logic seem sound to you? I'm not convinced I'm right about any of this, by the way, but just I'm looking at places that I admire, Pew Research and The Economist and how they're handling it and going, well, that looks pretty good to me. So anything look good, not look good? What are your thoughts on this? Steve, I think all your points made a lot of sense and, and definitely from a visual standpoint. So now the fun thing will be if we can all follow your tutorials and create them. <laughs> the, the, I, I don't think you're going to have a problem with it. The one that you'll find annoying is to get to have this consist, if you want to have several, one visualization for a whole bunch of Likert scale questions, and you want to have everything line up and be consistent, there's this these hidden reference lines that force the axes not to expand and contract and they're a pain in the ass but you can just copy um, the formulas versus when i just separated them into three columns oh this was just so easy there was you know no effort whatsoever involved with this and man have i become lazy with this stuff so that's the only thing 
And Josh, you kind of tipped your hand. And I asked my, my colleagues here, hey, could you look at the poll ahead of time? And Josh weighed in, hey, I'm on team A, the mm-hmm. uh, divergent approach. And I didn't want to tell people before I asked them, this is a pain in the ass. So before you vote for it, you're all going to have to make it. Yeah. You know that I follow your existing protocol to the letter, Steve. It's worked out really well. And my my clients who have to look at this data enjoy it. But Josh and I have been texting back and forth about the new stuff that we're going to implement based on today. So I think it's really great. I really do. But there are kinds of data that, that we don't work with. For example, a number of the questions in the Q&A are about handling longitudinal data, which is something that my type of research is not dealing with at all. And then we've also got some questions about how to handle open-ended responses, or what do you do with the sort of other category on uh, choose all that apply or single select questions? I know that you have covered some of this stuff in the past, but is there hope well, they, for new approaches down the line? The longitudinal stuff, I'm, by the way, if it's just between two periods, do a comment chart. It just kicks ass. Let me see if I can find that. Here's what, you know, for not many months, just between two periods, this is so much fun. Let me find it for you pretty quickly. To me, this presses all the right buttons in that it's easy to implement and it looks cool. Who doesn't like that? You get the idea. Previous period, this period. So this is sales. Wait, we can't see it yet. You have to share your Uh, I keep doing that, man. You know what? No, people need to use their imaginations here. (laughs) All right, here we go. So this is in fact percentage of promoters, not net promoter score. And hey, previous period we were here, but it moved up here. It's not hard to make this thing. So this could be a great way to do it, but you're still only looking at two periods worth of data. Okay. The next time I share my screen, I'm going to remember to share my screen. I want to be able to share months worth of data. That's why I'm asking, hey, if you've got longitudinal net promoter score data, send it to me. I'm, I'm, I would like to see it. So if you can share this stuff with me and I'm happy to sign an NDA, I am looking for open-end response data. So longitudinal data, if it's just two periods, yeah, it's comet chart or something like that. If it's, but I'm in particular looking for longitudinal MBS data. I haven't really been looking at what's been coming into the Q&A and what's been coming into chat. I'm sorry, go ahead, Shaylin. Oh, I was just going to say, I know you mentioned a little bit about open ends and there was this question specific to word clouds. And I know you've given me your perspective on word clouds in the past. So I thought it might be interesting just to reiterate that. So there, there are two issues with the word cloud. One is, did your text mining group related things together? Use a word to describe the mood you're in. And I am sad, I'm bereft, I'm morose, I'm melancholy, I'm crestfallen, whatever. And you get like 15 responses each to that. And then on the, I'm happy, and I'm delighted. 80 people said happy, three people said delighted. So you've got this in this word cloud, you've got this huge happy. And you go, look, people are way happier than sad because you have all these different synonyms for sad and they're all really small. So one is, has something in fact merged the sentiment so you're getting something accurate for it. The other is, I'm fine with a word cloud if you don't need to make an accurate comparison. Meaning if, if it's just a feeling and if there's one response that truly is so much larger, maybe that comes across. But otherwise, it's, gee, it's hard to see what these things are and how much larger is this than this other thing. Yeah, it looks nice, but unless something is so big and, it's, and someone has done the linguistic analysis properly, that you've got this giant word and everything is tiny, Hey, maybe that'll work because it'll have an emotional impact, but otherwise I don't think it's uh, uh, a really useful way of, of presenting. Steve, there's some questions and it brings a question that I had to mind as well. So some Likerts don't have a central neutral option. For example, in our research, we don't use an, a center point because a lot of people use that for, I don't really want to answer that question or do, so you don't really know what it means. And Amy has a question about Likert scales that are unipolar. So they're not, they're, the, the middle option is not actually a neutral.
general. How do you feel about what you might do in those in, in either situation in terms of pulling out maybe the more neutral, like in our scales that we use, the two center points, since there isn't a center, the two closest, pulling that out as a neutral or the less intense option in a scale. The so there one if it's an even scale mm -hmm. thing, way easier to visualize in Tableau. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't have to worry, what do I do about this thing which is somewhere in the middle? Every one that I've worked with, there's some notion of demarcation point between and positive so agree, the example, disagree. The example she gives is not at all to always. So not existing at all to, uh, or not doing at all to doing this all the time. That scale doesn't have a, it's not bipolar per se, where there's a neutral option. They're all elements of doing to some degree. And all of these, look, this is why you can't say this score is twice as big as that other score. The, how frothy do you think a cappuccino should be? And it's, oh, this is saying it should be super frothy. Oh, it should only be a little frothy. Is that five times frothier than this? No. So the whole notion of the number is trying to put these quantities on it. So I'd have to think about it a little bit more or see the example, but at some point you're going never, sometimes, often. And this amorphous sometimes is sitting in the center. And that becomes the, maybe it's three things to the left and two things to the right. But for me, there's some line in the sand that is showing the degree to which this is skewing one way or the other. And by the way, you are super welcome to disagree with me and send me an example and say, here's what I'm talking about. And here's why I think that would be misleading. So this is my responding to the thing, but by all means, show me something which is, oh, here's, you didn't quite get it. Here's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So Amy says maybe the middle option in her situation may just be sometimes yeah. differentiating between never and always something in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Someone asked if, if they send you data to, to look at that's that, and you produce something, will they get the, whatever you produce, will that be shared? Here, I will certainly share it with them. And then if they are comfortable with me sharing the stuff with the world, it will be under their terms as to how it gets shared with the world. If it's a sensitive survey, it, it's to what degree can I share any of the things that are in here? How do you want it anonymized or whatever? If you send me something, by the way, no guarantee that I'll have the time to look at it, but I am searching for some good examples of this stuff. Do, do you see different types of audiences preferring some of these things like gap charts? Is that something that only researchers can really relate to? Or do you think a general audience, which probably many of the people on the call, I know I deal with clients who are not research informed or viz informed very well, which is why I always send them your books. But well, the, um, the, the, I've got to say the, 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 the gap chart, yeah. connected dot plot, whatever, you, that's for mere mortals. That plays into what humans do really well. Pew research. We use the gap chart with our clients and they love it. They get it, yeah. even if they're not I, very well. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this is a, a tough, you know, you know, if they don't immediately get it, 30 seconds of your time to teach them how to read it, worth it. So I don't think there's anything in here. The look at Pew Research is not doing research for academics. They're doing stuff that's read by the as as Florence Nightingale might say, the vulgar public. It's for the it's for everybody to understand this. So the gap charts, the divergent type of stuff, I I they all may require up to a minute, but you're not talking about, wow, this one's a chord diagram or a sand key diagram or something which is with a reverse three-quarter twist with a level of 9.8 level of difficulty or something like that. I don't think anything here is, is particularly a tough read. Anything that the, the three of you have had where, boy, this is a great way to show it, but people are not buying it. Like that more concentrated values in the center. That's not intuitive. You're used from going worst, not worst, neutral, good, fantastic. And I'm saying put worst and fantastic right next to each other. That's not intuitive. I think it's the right way to do it, but I've got to hip somebody to, you know, why I'm doing it that way. And th that's one where I think 
hey, see, this is great, but you put the things in the wrong order. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I put them from most, most opinionated into the center to the most okay going out towards the sides. Thanks for hanging uh, out. Hope to have this posted by next week at the latest. And thanks for sharing a little time with me today.